And everybody said, I welcome everyone to our leadership development session in Jesus' name. It takes the grace of God to listen to the same pastor 10 years, 20 years, and still feel excited coming. For many people, everything becomes normal, usual. Oh, he's Pastor so and so he's going to talk again. But thank God for the grace of God in your life. For the excitement you have. That you always know that the Spirit of God is present. And it will use your leader, your pastor, your father in the Lord. Something new will come in your life every time you come. A better headquarters, amen. I'm plead with the people who are taking it just casual and they come when they want to. The grace God has given you also pass on to them that they too, they'll have the same excitement and the same expectation that you have and they'll always be here so that they can be better leaders of the people they are leading in Jesus' name. Will you do it? God is trusting, depending on you, you'll do it in Jesus' name. Father, we well, thank you for this hour. Thank you for this moment. We are asking that your spirit will be mightily present and you touch every life and turn everyone in the right direction and lead us so that we can lead others in Jesus' name. Impart something definite to every life. Thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. God bless you. You can see them. Tonight, we come to special leadership development teaching. We're looking at Luke chapter 11. And I'm reading from verse 1. Luke 11 verse 1. And it came to pass that as he was praying, the Son of God, the Savior, our Lord, the eternal one, he was praying. The one that is both God and man, the God man, he was praying. The one that came from heaven and he was involved in the creation of the world. Now he is here and because he is here, he's got a work to do, a job to do. The Father had sent him, and so that he will fulfill the will of the Father. Do the work of the Father. He prayed. If he prayed, how about me? How about you? If he did not just depend on the gifts he had, on the talent he had, on the power he had, on the knowledge he had, and he still prayed. You ought to pray, I ought to pray. And it came to pass that as he was praying in a certain place, when he seized, one of his disciples said unto him, Lord, teach us to pray, as John also taught his disciples. Lead us must teach not just doctrine. They also should teach how to pray. John taught his disciples how to pray. You are a leader. You ought to teach the Lord's disciples who are under your care how to pray. Why did they ask him teach us to pray? They saw prayer was his habit, pattern of life passion and gave him power. They saw that God answered his prayers and because of that, they wanted him. They could have gone to John. They knew some of the disciples of John. They could have asked any of those disciples of John, what did John, your leader, your master, taught you? 
But they did it. They wanted their own Lord, their own master, their own leader, their own captain. They wanted him to teach them how that contradicts the attitude of some people here in our midst. And instead of praying as the Lord is teaching us here, They'll go to mountain, to the valley, they borrow this book and borrow this book. When this happens, this is how to pray. The disciples didn't do that. One of the disciples said, teach us to pray. As John also taught his disciples. We're looking at verse 8. In verse 8, I say unto you, though he will not rise and give him because he is his friend yet because of his importunity because of his importunity he will rise and give him as many as he needed and now the lord brought the application in verse 9 ask and i say unto you ask and it shall be given unto you seek and ye shall find, knock, and it shall be opened unto you. Verse 10, in verse 10, for everyone that asketh receiveth, he that seeketh findeth, and to him that knocketh it shall be opened. Look at verse 13. In verse 13, it says, if ye then being evil, it's talking about their depravity, their natural self, and they come into this world all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Everyone without grace is evil. So if you've been evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children. How much more shall your heavenly Father give? the Holy Spirit to them that ask him, your heavenly father, they were born again. You know, there are people that say that the disciples were not born again until Christ went to the cross. Jesus said, he was talking to his disciples, your heavenly father, give the Holy Spirit to them that ask him. We come as leaders and we need the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost, and He, as we ask Him, as children of God, as we ask Him, He gives us the Holy Spirit. Look at Ephesians chapter 4. I'm reading from verse 11. Ephesians 4, verse 11. And He gives some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. Those were titles for leaders in the early church. And these are still titles for leaders in the present day and time church. Apostles, pastors, prophets, evangelists, teachers. We're going to concentrate on the last three today, evangelists, pastors, teachers, the leader evangelist, the leader pastor, the leader teacher. How we need the Holy Ghost in our lives. How we need the Holy Spirit in our lives. To start with, we're born again by the conviction and conversion of the Holy Spirit. And he who does not have the Spirit of Christ is none of his. At the birth, being born again, at the immediate entrance into the kingdom of God, except a man be born of water, the word, and the spirit, the Holy Spirit. He cannot see, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. And then he tells us, the Gentiles sanctified by the Spirit of God. He is involved in our salvation. He is involved in our sanctification. The Holy Spirit is the one that also makes us Holy, and it makes us holy in our spirit, humble in our spirits, 
unhypocritical in our spirit, transparent in our spirit, the Holy Spirit, the saving spirit, the Holy Spirit, the sanctifying spirit, the Holy Spirit is also the one that fills us when we're baptized he empowers us the empowering spirit the enlightening spirit the guiding spirit he guides us in the anointing and appointing ministry uh, spirit is the one that anoints us appoints us and empowers us enlightens us we're saved we're sanctified and we're baptized in the holy spirit because of his agency, because of his involvement, because of his transforming power in our lives. Now we come to the leader, the evangelist, to the leader, the pastor, to the leader, the teacher. We're looking at three things here. In, three, in, uh, in number one, the might and the power of the Spirit in the leader evangelist. Number two, the ministry and perception of the spirit in the leader teacher. Number four, number three is the motive for presence of the spirit in the leader pastor. The evangelist, a leader. The teacher, a leader the pastor, a leader, and the Spirit of God makes us the kind of teacher, the kind of evangelist, and the kind of pastor we ought to be. Look at that. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 11, he gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers. Verse 12. In verse 12, it says, For the perfecting of the saints and the work for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. It's the, the, the leaders of the church that will bring up, disciple, and train, and transform the members and they become workers for the workers in the ministry and for the perfecting of the saints our ministry at work is to perfect whatever is imperfect in the lives of the members of the church so that the body of Christ will be as strong as spiritual as steadfast as they thought to be, look at verse 13. In verse 13, till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man. That's our goal. That's where we're going. That's what we're praying for. That's what we're expecting that the Lord will do for the perfecting of the saints unto a perfect man unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. We're looking at number one, the might and the power of the Spirit in leader evangelism. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, reading from verse 5, it says, But watch thou in all things, and deal afflictions. Do the work of an evangelist. Uh, can you see two things there? Endure affliction and do the work of an evangelist. The work of a soul winner. The work of the one that reaches out to the regions beyond. Even though there are discomforts and inconveniences and hardships and difficulties, keep on doing the work of an evangelist. Make full proof of thy ministry. And now he gives us a, a model. He gives us a personality that was really an evangelist. We're looking at Acts chapter 21, reading from verse 8, and it says, And uh, the next day we that were of Paul's company departed and came unto Caesarea, and we entered into the house of Philip the evangelist. 
Philip, the evangelist leadership role was carried out as an evangelist. And you know his story when he went to Samaria and he preached the word of God and he preached the kingdom of God and he preached Christ unto them. And many people were saved. They repented. They believed on the Lord. They were baptized in water and uh, he cast out the devils. There was great joy in that city. The Philip the evangelist, which was one of the seven, and were both with him. Look at three things there about the Spirit of God in the evangelist as a leader. Look at number one, the Spirit's penetration penetrating power in the evangel evangelist must have that. The power of the Spirit that penetrates into the hearts of people. Number two, the Spirit's persuading power in the evangelist. He must be able to convince and persuade the people who are either idol worshippers, they are heathens, they are pagans, they are religious people, they are in another religion. He must be able to persuade them that this Christ he is the Savior, the only Savior. The Spirit's persuading power in the evangelist. Number three, the Spirit's prevailing power. The things to contend with, the Spirit's prevailing power. Sickness, he must have the power to prevail. Demons, he must have a power to prevail upon them. And all the chains and all the shackles and all the yokes that the people have, the evangelists must have the Spirit's prevailing power over all those things as an evangelist. Look at number one. Number one, we're looking at the Spirit's penetrating power in the evangelist. Micah chapter 3 verse 8. It says, truly, I am a fool of power by the Spirit of the Lord and of judgment. He judges their sin. He judges all their evil and of might. And uh, to declare unto Jacob, to declare unto the audience before the evangelist his transgression and to Israel his sin. That's what an evangelist has to do. In John chapter 6, Team. Reading from verse 7, here is the promise of the Lord, nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Spirit, the Comforter, will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him, the Spirit, him, the Holy Ghost, him, the third personality in the Holy Ghost, I will send him unto you. Look at verse 8. In verse 8, and when he, the Spirit, is come, he will reprove the world of sin. That is the ministry of the evangelist. He has to reprove the world of sin. He has to tell them and show them where they had gone astray so that they'll be able to remember recollect themselves, repent and return unto the Lord and it says and of righteousness and of judgment in verse 9 verse 9 says of sin because they believe not on me all those who have not believed on the Lord they live in sin and the evangelist has that penetrating power to bring them under conviction. In verse 10, verse 10 says of righteousness because I go to my father and you see me no more. And then verse 11, now it says in verse 11 of judgment because the praise of this world is judge. That's what the evangelist does. He convinces the people that even the prince of this world is judge. Acts of the Apostle chapter 2, reading from verse 36, here Peter stood before a crowd, thousands of people, and he stood as an evangelist, a preacher that will convict, convince them of sin, convict them of sin, and call them to the Savior, and they come to the Savior, they are born again Again, the ministry of the evangelist. Acts chapter 2 verse 36, therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that 
God has made that same Jesus whom he crucified both Lord and Christ. Look at verse 37. Verse 37 now, when they had heard, when they heard this, they were preached in their heart, and they said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? The evangelist, by the penetrating power of the Spirit of God, must bring the sinners to the point that they were convicted and condemned. But now they want to be converted, but they don't know how. So they are asking the evangelist, what shall we do? The word had penetrated them, had convicted them that they were sinners and they needed salvation. They want to know what shall we do? And the evangelist must be ready to tell them this is the way, the way of life and the way of salvation. Look at verse 38. Verse 38 says, is, then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission, for the cleansing, for the forgiveness of sins. And ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. That the ministry of the evangelists, they carry in the word by the power by the perception of the Holy Spirit so that the people who hear will understand they're sinners, they need salvation, and the Savior has died for them so that they can be saved. And then they take the path they ought to take, that they repent, they turn away from sin, they turn to the Lord, to the Savior, and they have faith, faith, believe. In the Lord Jesus Christ are the only Savior and they are saved. That's the work of the evangel. Look at number two here. Is the Spirit's persuading power in the evangelist. The Spirit's persuading power in the evangelist. When you go out as an evangelist to a new culture, to a new nation, to a new language people, to the people that need Christ as their Savior. You must understand who they are, what they know, what they don't know. And you must come from the place of bringing the Word of God to them to persuade them that they are sinners, to persuade them that Christ and only Christ is the Savior to persuade them that this is the day of salvation and the come to the Lord. We're looking at Acts chapter 13. And in Acts chapter 13, we're reading from verse 2. And as they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said, Separate unto me, separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work whereunto I have called them. To the work whereunto I have called them them. Look at uh, verse 43 there. In verse 43 was the work now when the congregation was broken up. Many of the Jews and the religious proselytes followed Paul and Barnabas who speaking to them look at this, look at this persuaded them evangelists, persuaded them, proselytes Gentiles that became Jews, but they were not justified, became Jews, but they were not saved. They heard the word of God. And now, as evangelists, Paul and Barnabas persuaded them to continue in the grace of God. They had heard about the grace of God. That that's the only way to be saved. By grace are you saved. Not, that not of yourself. It is the gift of God. They had come into that grace of God. Now they want to continue in that grace of God. They persuaded them. Look at verse 44. In verse 44, and the next day, the next Sabbath day came, almost the whole 
city together. The people that got saved, the people that got the grace of what they had gone to tell other people, we discovered the Savior. We learned about the Savior. Now we are saved and the grace of God has come into our lives and they too persuaded others. And those people came to hear the word of God. Look at verse 48. In verse 48, it tells us, and when the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and they glorified the word of the Lord. And as many as were ordained to eternal life, believe that the work of the evangelist will get to the point that they, the people that listen to you, they believe. What did they believe? That they could not save themselves. What did they believe? That their religion could not save them. What did they believe? That their good words cannot save them. What did they believe? That Christ who died for us on the cross of Calvary is the Savior, the only Savior. And as they believe, they had eternal life. Look at verse 49. In verse 49, and the word of the Lord was published throughout all the region. We're looking in at chapter 18 of Acts, Acts chapter 18, and we're reading from verse 4. And he reasoned in the, in the synagogue every Sabbath and persuaded the Jews and the Greeks that the work of the evangelist, reasoning from the scripture, analyzing from the scripture, explaining from the scripture, exposition and from the scripture to bring the people to persuasion that this is the very Christ. Look at verse 8. And in verse 8 were told, and Crispus, the chief ruler of the synagogue, believed. The chief ruler of the synagogue, the one that had been promoting a tradition and the old covenant and the old animal sacrifices. Now he has said that Christ is the final sacrifice and he believed with all his house. And it says that many of the Corinthians hearing believed and they were baptized look at verse 9 in verse 9 they speak the Lord to Paul in the night by a vision be not afraid but speak be not afraid keep on persuading them and heaven supported him speak it says and hold not thy peace in verse 10 verse 10 it says for I am with thee the evangelist has to be very sure that the Lord is with him because he'll have quite a lot of people against him he'll have the ideologies and the philosophies of the land against him he'll have the religion and the religion is of the people against him he has to be sure that the God of heaven is with him and God gave him that assurance so he could speak boldly and confidently and convincingly that Christ is the Savior I am with thee and no man shall set on thee to hurt thee they may try they may plan they may plot but no man shall set on thee to, uh, to hurt thee for I have much people in this city, Acts of the Apostles chapter 19, and I'm reading here from verse 8. Acts chapter 19, verse 8, it says, And he went into the synagogues and spake boldly, confidently, assuredly, for the space of three months, disputing and persuading and persuading and persuading the things concerning the kingdom of God. Look at verse 10. In verse 10 it says, And this continued by the space of two years, so that all they that dwelt in Asia heard the word of the Lord Jesus, both Jews and Greeks. Look at verse 18. The result 
of him ministering to the Gentiles, ministering to the sinners, and they come into the Lord. And many that believed came and confessed and showed their deeds. Look at verse 19. Many of them also, which used curious as brought their books, their materials, their charms together, and they bunch them. Uh, there you know the effective conversion of the sinners. There must be a transformation that what they believe in, who they believe in now, has totally changed their understanding and their conception about salvation. And it says they burnt all those things before all men, and they counted the price of them and found it 50,000 pieces of silver. And then he tells us in verse 20, in verse 20, so mightily grew the word of God and prevailed. So mightily because of the ministry of the evangelist and because of the impact and the prevailing power of the evangelist, it says the word of God grew Mightily. We're looking at chapter 19, verse 26. Acts chapter 19, verse 26. It says, Moreover, you see and hear that not alone at Ephesus, out, it says, but almost throughout all Asia, this Paul standing as an evangelist. This Paul ministering as an evangelist has persuaded, that's the word, the persuading power. An evangelist must have that. That they will reject their old religion and then come to Christ and know and be persuaded that this Christ is the Savior, the only Savior persuaded and turned away much people saying that there be no gods which are made with hands. And then in verse 27, in verse 27 it says, So that not only this our craft is in danger to be set at naught, it says, but also that the temple of the great goddess Diana should be despised. That's at the point they got to. And then it says, and her magnificence should be destroyed, whom all Asia and the world worship. It. Look at number three here. Number three is the Spirit's prevailing power through the evangelist. The evangelist must also have the prevailing power by the Spirit of God, the power that prevails on the sinners, the surrender, the power that prevails on sicknesses, and sicknesses are healed, the power that prevails on evil spirits, and those evil spirits are cast out. The Spirit's prevailing power through the evangelist. It tells us in First Thessalonians chapter 1, reading from verse 5, our gospel came not unto you in words only. The evangelist must not only have, uh, you know, the scriptures he quotes and the scriptures he explains and the scriptures he applies and then calling the people to repentance, not in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Ghost and in much assurance as she know what manner of men, what manner of preachers, what manner of ministers, what manner of evangelists we were among you for you your sake. In verse 6, it says in verse 6, and ye became followers of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much affliction with joy of the Holy Ghost. Verse 7, in verse 7 it says, so that ye were 
examples to all that believe in Macedonia and Achaia. Look at verse 8. In verse 8, for from you sounded out the word of the Lord, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place your faith to God uh, well, to God word is spread abroad so that we need not speak anything. We're told in verse 9, it says in verse 9, for they themselves show of us what manner of entering in we add unto you and how ye turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God. In Romans chapter 15, reading from verse 18, the prevailing power by the Spirit of God through the evangelist. In Romans chapter 15, verse 18, if I will not dare to speak of any of those things which Christ has not wrought by me, to make the Gentiles obedient by word and deed. Verse 19, it says, Through mighty signs and wonders, the evangelists, through mighty signs and wonders, and by the power of the Spirit of God. That's how the evangelist works. That's how he gets the conversion of the people. That's how he gets the kill. For the people and that's how he gets an effective casting out of evil spirits so that from Jerusalem and round about unto Illyricum I have fully preached the gospel of Christ. It tells us in Acts chapter 8 reading from verse 5 this prevailing power of the evangelists were told in Acts 8 verse 5, then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ unto them. Christ, Savior, unto them. Christ, the healer, unto them. Christ, the redeemer, unto them. He preached Christ, the deliverer, unto them. He preached Christ, the Christ that has power power to forgive, power to set free, and power to transform the life of the people listening. You must preach Christ in such an explicit way, in such a way that they know that this is what Christ will do. This is what he has done. And as I believe, as they believe what he has done, then they see what he will do today. He pray Christ to them, Christ saving them. Christ healing them. Christ delivering them. Look at verse 6. In verse 6, it tells us, And the people with one accord gave heed unto those things which Philip spake, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. In verse 7, it says, For unclean spirits, crying with loud voice, came out of many, and that were possessed with them, and many taken, seized, possessed with palsies that were lame or healed. And then in verse 8, and there was much joy, great joy in that city. That's the ministry of the evangelist. And he has the spirit. You want to be an evangelist? You're an evangelist already. You must have the penetrating power of the Spirit. You must have the persuading power of the Spirit. And you must have the prevailing power of the Spirit. Let's come to number two now. We're looking at the leader, the teacher. The leader, the teacher. The ministry and perception of the leader or in the leader teacher. And once again, we're looking at Ephesians chapter 4, and we're reading from verse 11. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. Why? 
What are they to do? What's their composite ministry supposed to achieve? Look at verse 12. In verse 12, for the perfecting, for the maturing, for the training, for the discipling, for the development of the saints, for the work of the ministry. Now, if you remove the punctuation mark between saints and form, you read it like this, for the perfecting of the saints for the work of the ministry. You, you are developing the saints so that they too can be effectually raised up for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. And then it says, we continue, continue until, look at verse 13, until, until, until we all come in the unity of the faith. The evangelist should not stop, the teacher should not stop, the pastor should not stop, the apostle should not stop, the prophet should not stop until we, the body of Christ, will come to the unity of the faith, of the knowledge of the Son of God, and to a perfect man, a perfect man unto the measure of the, of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Look at verse 14. In verse 14, that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the sledge of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive. And we're looking at three things here about the teacher. Number one, the spirit stirring of hearts through the teacher. The teacher should not be a dull speaker, monotonous speaker, an uninteresting speaker. The people are just enduring and tolerating and they're just sitting down there or standing up there and wondering when is he going to finish. No. He stirs the hearts of the people with the teaching of the word of God. Number two, the spirit searching of hearts by the teacher. And number three, the spirit sight and insight for the hearts through the teacher. We're looking at number one. Number one, the spirit stirring of hearts through the teacher. In Luke chapter 23, reading from verse 5, here's the ministry of the teacher. He has what he does, what the scriptures, what the teaching, he stirs up the hearts of the people. Look at it in Luke chapter 23, verse 5. And there were the more fear, saying, he stirreth up, he stirreth up the people, teaching throughout all Judea, beginning from Galilee to this place. That's about Christ. He was full of the Spirit. He had the Spirit without measure. And in his teaching, he stirred up their hearts. He made them to think about what they had known. He made them to see that everything they knew will not save them. He made them to know that the Savior was now come and he stirred up their spirit. He told them, except you believe that I am he. You'll die in your sin. And they had to think about that. They had to ruminate about that. They had to meditate on that. He stirred up their spirit. In Luke chapter 24, verse 32. Luke chapter 24, reading from verse 32. And they said one to another, Did not our heart Born within us while he Christ talks with us by the way and while he opened to us the scriptures did not our heart burn when the teacher speaks the teacher following Christ the teacher model after the pattern of Christ he gets to the heart of the people they search up they had bonds within them, and they had seized how to make a decision 
to move from here to a higher level. It tells us in Jeremiah chapter 23, reading from verse 29, is not my word like as a fire? And when that fire comes in contact with something combustible, there'll be a stirring, there'll be a searching, and there will be a burning. It's not my word like as fire, says the Lord, and like a hammer that breaketh the rock in pieces. You know, there are people that you see, the people are hard and hardened. They are tough and toughened. Therefore, what could I have done? I went there. I spoke to the people. They are just looking at me like this. They couldn't move because their hardness was so much. No, it says the word is like a hammer. And when the Spirit of God empowers you, energizes you, and you use the hammer of the word the right way, the spiritual way, they will, uh, those rocks will be broken in pieces in Jesus' name. And the word is like fire, like fire. And no matter how toughened, how hardened somebody is, when the fire comes, human beings never grow to the point of the level they can just, uh, you know, stay in the fire and nothing happens. Something must happen. The fire of the word by the Spirit will burn in them in Jesus' name. It says in Hebrews chapter 4, I'm reading here from verse 12. Hebrews chapter 4 verse 12, for the word of God is quick, sharp, and powerful, mighty, and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even uh, to the dividing asunder of the soul and spirit and it says and of the and of the spirits and joints and the marrow and it says and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart when the teacher teaches the intents the intention is examined in the hearts of people and all their thoughts and all their plans are touched by the word of the teacher. And it says in verse 13, in verse 13, neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight. And it says, but all things are naked and open, made manifest unto the eyes of him that we have to do. Look at number two here. Number two, about the teacher, the spirit searching the hearts of hearts by the teacher. In Psalm 139, reading from verse 23, search me, O God. How does God do that? By a thunder? No. How does God do that? By natural things on earth? No. He does that. He searches us by his word. His word coming from the mouth of the teacher. The teacher appointed by God, anointed by the Spirit of God. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. The word of God penetrates the heart as the teacher teaches and it examines the thoughts, it examines the heart. Then it says in verse 24, in verse 24, and see if there be any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Jeremiah chapter 17. And we're reading from verse 9, Jeremiah 17, verse 9, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Look at verse 10. I, the Lord, search the heart by the word. I, the Lord, search the heart by a spirit empowered, enlightened teacher of the word, I, the Lord, search the heart 
and I try the race, even to give every man according to his ways and according to the fruit of his doing. The Lord searches the heart through the ministry of the teacher of the word, so that as we know our hearts and we know our condition, we're able to go back to God, go back to Christ, go to Calvary, and through the cleansing power of that blood of the Lamb, it changes made and transformation is made. That the ministry of the teacher in Proverbs chapter 28, reading from verse 11. Proverbs 28, verse 11, the rich man is wise in his own conceit, but the poor that has that has understanding searches him out. The preacher may not be rich materially, financially, but this poor man had gone to the Lord and he has the spirit of God. And while the, the rich man is sitting there and he is uh, contented with himself and is consumed with himself, this poor teacher then comes and he has the word of God in his mouth. And that poor teacher of the word searches him out. In verse 13, verse 13, he tells us, He that covereth the sin shall not prosper. And the poor preacher, the poor teacher, must be bold enough to say and to declare, Whosoever, rich or poor, man or woman, covers a sin shall not prosper spiritually shall not prosper in the way of the spirit in the way of the kingdom shall not prosper in entering into the kingdom of god but whoso confesseth and forsaketh the teacher emphasizes it's not enough to confess the teacher must nail must drive the nail into the wood and say it's not just that you confess you must forsake also confess it and forsake it them shall have mercy because salvation comes by mercy look at acts of the apostle chapter 24 reading from verse 24 here is the ministry of the teacher the teacher of the word of god it says after certain days when felix came up with his wife drusilla which was a jewess he sent for paul and heard him concerning the faith in Christ. Paul was invited by this officer. Paul invited by this one and his wife was there. And there are people that will follow the human spirit, the humble spirit. Here is, a, here is royalty. Here is a king. Here he is here is somebody that has political power. I must be careful now. I must not tell everything I know. I must not preach everything I know. This man, Paul at this time was in prison. And this man had the power to release him. Paul was not looking for release. He was looking for fulfilling the ministry God had called him to. And so we're told in verse 25, in verse 25, and as he reasoned of righteousness, of temperance, and judgment to come, Felix trembled. Felix trembled. That the ministry of the teacher of the word of God that those who are in sin they do not allow those sinners wherever they are whatever position they hold whatever power they have and whatever authority they have either to imprison to incarcerate or to leave the person in the prison there the real teacher of the word will not miss words, will not be afraid. He's not thinking about himself. 
He's not thinking about his comfort. He's not thinking about his own convenience. He's not thinking about his pleasure. He's not thinking about pain. There are people that speak so as to avoid pain. But you say pain is terrible. I don't want to have any pain. No, the teacher doesn't think about avoiding pain and attracting pleasure. He only thinks about one thing. The person I'm talking to has a soul of eternal value. And if I don't tell him how to get saved, how to come out of sin and come to the Savior, there may be nobody else that will tell him so. I have to tell him that the attitude and that is the attribute of a teacher, a teacher of the word. And it says, when he spoke, Felix trembled and answered, Go thy way for this time when I have a convenient season, I will call for thee. The man was not saved, but he had a chance to either decide for Christ or to decide to remain where he was. Let's look at number three here. Number three, we're looking at the spirit sight and insight for hearts through the teacher. It's the, it's the, it's the spirit of God that gives us sight, that gives us understanding, that gives us insight as a teacher of the word of God. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, reading there from verse 9, it says, but as it is written, I have not seen, no ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for them that love him. Look at verse 10. In verse 10, but God has revealed them unto us by his Spirit. What eyes have not seen? Salvation. The effect of salvation. The transformation we have through salvation. The righteousness. Transparent righteousness that comes through salvation. What eyes have not seen? The sanctification. The holiness, transparent holiness without hypocrisy. The sanctification, the transforming, purifying sanctification that makes us to live in the public, in the private, anywhere, everywhere, a sanctified life. Sanctification, what uproots the Adamic nature, the circumcision that God himself performs in the heart. Eyes have not seen, ears have not heard. The things prepared for the people of God, the healing, the miracle, the power manifestation, the demonstration of the power of God that eyes have not seen, the moving of the mountain and the destroying of the works of the devil that man has not seen, ears have not heard, but now God has revealed them unto us by his spirit. That's why the teacher who teaches the word and wants to lift up the hearers from what they know to what they don't know, from what they have heard to what they have not heard, from what they have seen to what they have not seen. That's why such a teacher must be so filled by the Spirit of God. It says, for the Spirit searches all things, yea, the deep things of God. Look at verse 11. In verse 11, it says, for what man knoweth the things of a man save except the spirit of man which is in him even so the things of God knoweth no man but the spirit of God and if you want to know that what other men do not know you must have that spirit of God dwelling profusely dwelling in entirely inside you look at verse 12 in verse 12 now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God, that we might know 
the things that are freely given to us of God. In verse 13, verse 13 says, which things also will speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. It tells us in Job, in Ephesians chapter 3, reading from verse 7. Ephesians chapter 3, we're reading from verse 7. It says, whereof I was made a minister. I didn't make myself a minister. When he makes you a minister, every gift, all the gifts for ministry, it will put in you. According to the gift of the grace of God given unto me by the effectual working of his power. And then it says in verse 8, in verse 8, unto me, who am less than the least of the saints is this grace given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. And then in verse 9, verse 9, and to make all men see what the fellowship of the mystery which from the beginning of the world has been hid in God. Think about that. From the beginning of the world, from Genesis to Malachi, what the people of the world had not known, now revealed unto him by the Spirit. And he is called as a teacher to come and teach that word uh, that will be the unsearchable riches of the kingdom of God who created all things by Jesus Christ. In Job chapter 34, reading from verse 31, Job 34, verse 31, it says, Surely it is me to be said unto God, I have a born chastisement. I will not offend anymore. That's the result of a teacher indwelt by the Spirit of God, teaching the people they realize I've offended in this area. I never thought about that. In that area, I never thought about that. But now, a bunch of I've born, I've accepted the correction, and I will offend no more. In verse 32, verse 32, that which I see not, teach thou me. And God does that often by the ministry of the teacher. That which I see not, teach thou me, if I have done iniquity, I will do no more. Looking at chapter 33 of Job, Job chapter 33, we're reading from verse 23. It says, if there be a messenger within, an interpreter, one among a thousand to show unto man is uprightness. That's, that's what the teacher does. He is an interpreter. He is a messenger of the Lord to show unto man what really he needs to think about. Is he upright or is he not upright? In verse 24, in verse 24, then is gracious unto him after the teacher has revealed and he himself has responded and said, deliver him from going down to the pit and I have found a ransom. If the teacher will show the man is seen. It'll show that same man is savior. It showed the man his rottenness. And then show that same man his redeemer. So that he does not remain in the sin. He does not remain in the rottenness. He seeks the savior. He has the redeemer. He has a ransom. Look at verse 25. In verse 25. His flesh is been sick. It had affected his flesh, his skin, his appearance, but now he's found a ransom. 
is found the Redeemer. And he goes to the Redeemer and he prays unto the Lord. And his flesh shall be, shall be fresher than a child's flesh. He shall return to the days of his youth. Look at verse 26. It tells us he shall pray unto God and he will be favorable unto him. The teacher, the messenger, the interpreter is the one that leads him how to pray. And he shall see his face with joy for he will render unto man his righteousness. 27 In 27 he looketh upon men and if any say I have sinned and perverted that which was right and it profited me not. Verse 28, in verse 28, it will deliver his soul from going into the pit through the ministry of the teacher. A spirit indwelt teacher, a spirit inspired teacher, a spirit impacted teacher because it's a teacher of the word and he brings the truth. He will get people saved from going down into the pit and his life shall see the light. Amen. Amen. Number three now. Point number three. We're looking at the pastor. The evangelist, a leader. The teacher, a leader. The pastor, shepherd, a leader. The motive for the presence of the Spirit in the leader pastor. We'll come back again to Ephesians chapter 4. And we're reading from verse 11. It says, and he gives some apostles, he, Christ, who gives gifts after he ascended on high, he gives some to be apostles and some prophets. He raised up some to be prophets and then and some evangelists. An evangelist that just, you know, gets up and makes himself an evangelist, he cannot do everything the Lord expects a New Testament evangelist to do. But when Christ gives, he gives some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. And so we see there the ministry of the pastor. Why? Look at verse 12. It says for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. In verse 13, it says till we all come. The pastor must keep on pastoring till we all come. The evangelist must keep on evangelizing till we all come. The teacher must keep on teaching till we all come in the unity of the faith. The question is, the body of Christ, all the denominations, all the churches, all the assemblies, have we come to the unity of the faith, to the knowledge of the Son of God, have we become in totality, in totality, the perfect man? Have we all come, each and all, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ? Not yet. If we have not come to that level, the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, teachers, must keep on in the ministry of perfecting the saints. And then it says in verse 14, in verse 14, that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the sledge of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in which to deceive. We're looking at Acts chapter 20, Reading from verse 26, Acts 20, verse 26, Wherefore I take you to record this day that I am pure 
from the blood of all men. How? Why? Verse 27. In verse 27, for I have not shunned, I have not neglect, ne neglected, I have not shunned my responsibility to declare unto you all the counsel of God. Now in verse 28, it says, Take heed, therefore, unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost has made you overseers, pastor, shepherds, to feed the church of God. That's the ministry of the pastor, to feed the church of God, which he has purchased with his own blood. Three things we're looking at here. Number one, we're looking at profitable pastors feeding flocks with scripture by the spirit feeding flocks with scripture by the spirit number two punishable pastors fleecing flocks without the scripture or the spirit number three purposeful pastors that father the flocks shepherding by the Spirit. Look at number one. Number one, we're looking at profitable pastors feeding the flocks of Scripture by the Spirit. Hey, look at that again in Acts chapter 20, reading from verse 26. Acts chapter 20, verse 26, wherefore I take you to record this day that I am pure from the blood of all men. Paul speaking now as a pastor. Look at verse 27. In verse 27, for I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. He didn't omit any important word in the doctrines of the Bible that should get to the people. It didn't avoid, gloss over any part of the word of God because brother so-and-so is having that challenge. If I mention that, he might be offended. Sister so-and-so is having that weakness. If I mention that, she might feel offended as if the pastor does not have love. She know, he knows that I have that weakness and challenge. Why should he mention that Paul the apostle said, For I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. And now he tells us in verse 28, in verse 28, take heed therefore unto yourselves, he's talking to the pastors now and to all the flock, over the which the Holy Ghost has made you overseers to feed the church of God, which he has purchased with his own blood. Verse 32, in verse 32, he tells us, and now brethren, church, people, brothers, sisters, members, workers, leaders, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace which is able to build you up. The word of his grace which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among all them which are sanctified. It tells us in Jeremiah chapter 3 verse 15, the ministry of the pastor feeding the church of God. He must prepare just like those who prepare food for us in the physical, in the natural. They prepare very well to give us something healthy, something that will build up our body, something that will hinder disease so that we can eat to conquer disease. And that's what we do too in the words of the Lord as spiritual fathers and 
teachers and pastors of the word. It says in Jeremiah chapter 3 verse 15, and I will give you pastors according to my heart which shall feed you with knowledge and understanding. The pastors are according to the heart of the Lord. If you are a pastor, if you are a preacher, if you are a shepherd, if you are a father unto some people, you feed them with the word of God with knowledge and with understanding. In uh, chapter 23, reading from verse 4, Jeremiah chapter 23, verse, uh, verse 4, and I will set up shepherds, pastor shepherds, the same thing, you know, over them, which shall feed them, and they shall fear no more, nor be dismayed, neither shall they be lacking, says the Lord. That's the ministry of the pastor that is so equips the people, he so feeds the people, he so strengthens the people, they have no fear, they have no fretting, they rely on the Lord completely. It, uh, look at number two here. Number two is the punishable pastor fleecing flocks without scripture or the spirit. The people that, you know, try to attract uh, disciples unto themselves, followers unto themselves, but they fleece the people. They're, they're, they're thinking of their own gain, of what they'll get out of them, rather than what they'll give unto them. Acts chapter 20, reading from verse 29. In Acts chapter 20, verse 29, for I know this, that after my departure shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Bastachi, in Bastachi, also of your own selves shall men arise speaking perverse things, speaking contrary things, speaking compromising words, and speaking corrupting words to draw away disciples after them. Then in verse 31, he tells us, therefore watch and remember that by the space of three years, I cease not to warn everyone night and day with Tears that was the faithfulness of Paul the Apostle as a pastor, as a father, as a shepherd. And but she said there'll be people that will come in. And what will they do? They will pollute the message, they'll contradict the heavenly message, and they will compromise the word of the Lord. In Second Peter chapter. Two, reading from verse 1, Second Peter chapter 2, reading from verse 1, but there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers, false teachers among you, it says, and who privately, privately, surreptitiously, in a clever, cunning way, who privily shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them and bring upon themselves swift destruction. Look at verse 2. In verse 2, and many shall follow the pernicious ways. Those who have been hearing the truth and hearing the truth and hearing the truth, and then the truth speaker and the truthful teacher and the truth penetrating pastor. Maybe he goes aside, maybe he's gone. Then these people, they will come and then say something totally contrary. Salvation is no more giving us new life. Salvation is just what Christ has done. It has no effect in our heart. Sanctification, well, yes, it's there, but it doesn't mean that everybody will be holy and sanctified. Holy Ghost baptism, well, it was what the early apostles, but now we can live, and, and the world as we now have wisdom without the Holy Ghost, we can now have some strength and courage without uh, the Holy Ghost they come, and they turn everything upside down, you'll think nobody will believe them, many shall follow 
their pernicious ways, by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. Look at verse 3. In verse 3 it says, And through covetousness shall they with fain pretending hypocritical words make merchandise of you, whose judgment now of a long time lingereth not, and their damnation slumbereth not. Look at Jude chapter 1, only one chapter there, Jude. Reading from verse 16. In Jude chapter 1, verse 16, these are murmurers, these are complainers. These are the people walking after their own laws, and their mouth speaketh great swelling words, having men's persons in admiration because of advantage. Look at verse 7 there. In verse 7, but beloved, 17 rather, but beloved, remember ye the words which was spoken before of the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ in verse 18. Verse 18 says how that they told you there should be mockers in the last time who should walk after their own ungodly laws. Verse 19, verse 19, these be they who separate themselves they have to do that so as to get, uh, you know, some disciples. They'll not go to the sinners outside. They'll not go to the pagans outside. They'll not go to the heathens outside. But out of the congregation, they want to, you know, draw people away with them. They want to draw them to false doctrine. They want to draw them into liberty. You can do whatever you want and you'll see get to heaven with a big lie of the devil. But they do that so that they, they separate themselves, the essential having not the spirit. I pray the Lord deliver us from such people in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Look at number three here. Number three here. Purposeful pastors that father flocks shepherding by the spirit. Purposeful. The purpose to get sinners saved, purposeful. The purpose to disciple those who are saved, purposeful. The purpose to make the people who are saved, to endure unto the end. The purpose to so strengthen them so that they'll be steadfast in the Lord. Purposeful pastors. And that's the kind of pastor you ought to be. That's the kind of leader you ought to be. You have a purpose that you'll contribute positively. You'll contribute spiritually. You'll contribute consistently to the lives, to the growth, to the progress of the believers. It tells us, look at that, that kind of a pastor, how purposeful, how sacrificial, how giving of themselves they are. In uh, First Thessalonians chapter 2, reading from verse 7, but we were gentle among you, even as a nurse cherisheth her children. Verse 8, in verse 8, so being affectionately desirous of you, we were willing to have imparted unto you not the gospel of God only, not the teaching only, not the preaching only, but also our own souls, because you are dear and precious unto us. It tells us in verse 9, in verse 9, for ye remember, brethren, our labor and travail, laboring for laboring night and day, because we will not be chargeable unto any of you, we preach unto you the gospel of God. And then in verse 10, it shows us, for ye are witnesses, and God also, how holily and justly 
and unblameably we behaved ourselves among you that believe those are real, real ministers. Those are real teachers of the word. Those are real pastors of the word. They take care of their behavior one for themselves. Because without holiness, no man shall save the Lord too. Because of the example they will be to the flock. I'm a teacher. I must be careful what I do so that my behavior does not contradict my teaching. So that the people will not say, it's impossible to be holy. Look at the man, look at the teacher, look at the preacher, look at the pastor, emphasizing holiness, 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 and he himself in behavior is not able to live that holy life. He says, ye are witnesses, and God also, how holily, justly, unblameably will behave ourselves among you that believe. Then in verse 11, it says in verse 11, as she know how we exhorted and comforted and charged every one of you as a father, as a pastor, as a shepherd doth his children. I pray God will give us all the grace we need, all the strength we need, all the vigilance we need so that we live as pastors and, and teach and preach as pastors so that we turn the minds of the people unto Christ and they look unto Christ, unto Christ, unto Christ. They are transformed in their lives that they, the members of the church, will be like Christ, the head of the church. In 2 Corinthians chapter 3, reading from verse 18. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, reading from verse 18. But we all, as the teacher teaches, but we all, as the pastor preaches, but we all, as the evangelist uh, evangelizes, we all now with open face beholding the teachers, the pastors, the evangelists, the preachers, they have lifted up our sight unto Christ, to look unto Christ. And now, with open face, as in a glass, we see the glory of the Lord, and we're changed, members changed, ministers changed, workers changed, everyone, brother, sister, member of the body of Christ, that we have ministered to, they are changed unto the same image from glory to glory even as by the spirit of the lord we've heard much tonight and i pray the words we've heard will have impact on me impact on you impact on all of us together in jesus name that's from message to message from session to session, from training to training, from development session to development session, will be growing from grace to grace, having the image of Christ before us and having the transforming power, transforming our lives to what we ought to be in Jesus' name. God bless everyone. God transform everyone yeah. and God make everyone higher than we have ever been in Jesus' name. Yeah. Let's rise up now and talk to the Lord in prayer. Stand up now and with all your heart, with all sincerity, with all determination, with importunity, we we'll pray for the Holy Spirit to live constant, big, mighty in us as leaders, as leader evangelist, as leader teacher, as leader pastor. Pray the Lord will answer your prayer.
Tonight we 